we had one session and let's begin with the second session here. Yes, uh, Sony ma'am, are you here with us? Yes, yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm there. Right. Very good morning to all. Very good morning to all. So we are going to start with the session of uh, mini MBA in HR and uh, we are going to take forward from where we left yesterday. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, is my screen visible? I guess your screen is yes, visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Screen is visible. Okay, okay fine. So, uh, yesterday we had discussed about what is the significance of human resource management? What is the growing role of human resource management as a business partner? What is HR scorecard and how it is used to measure the effectiveness of HR function? We had also discussed about uh, human resource planning and we had also discussed how Walmart and other companies are doing their human resource planning, what kind of uh, methods they are using for job analysis. And from there, now today, we take on with recruitment and selection. And uh, here, we are going to discuss about a number of things. We are going to talk about recruitment and selection today. We are going to talk about performance appraisal. We are going to talk about performance management. And we're also going to discuss that what are the latest trends in the field of human resource management? And besides that, what are the careers in human resource management? So let's start with how from the business objectives, we have to move towards human resource planning. So as we were discussing about strategic human resource management yesterday, that HR function is derived from the organizational goals and strategies. After laying down the organizational goals and strategies, we have to link the HR function with the business objectives and then go for HR planning. Once we are uh, fine with the numbers and the quality of the people which we require, we have done human resource forecasting on the demand side, on the supply side, then we have to do the job analysis. That means we have to find out that what is the job description and what is the job specification for the various uh, jobs in the organization. So as I discussed yesterday also, I gave some examples that job description consists of the, uh, I mean, basically the tasks, duties and responsibilities which are required for the successful performance of a job. And job specification relates to the knowledge, skills and qualifications which are required for a particular job. Now, once we have done the job analysis, then we can start our recruitment process and from recruitment, we can carry forward our selection process. So generally these two terms, recruitment and selection are used together. We generally say recruitment selection. So of course, uh, where recruitment ends, their selection starts. But in talking language, we use them together. We call it recruitment and selection. But of course, we are going to discuss that technically, what is otherwise also when they are planning their uh, recruitment part, how to go about the entire process, uh, they do a proper competency analysis. That means for whatever uh, job of whatever job profile they want to fill up the post, a proper competency analysis of that particular job is done. That is a proper documentation is done as to what are the tasks, what are the duties, what are the responsibilities which the that particular job requires, what will be the tenure, what would be the ca a compensation, what, whom would that person report to? Who would be the subordinates of that person? What will be the accountability of that person? What will be the performance standards for that person? What are the expectations or what are the goals or what are the objectives which that person is going to attain at that particular uh, job profile? So they lay down everything in their competency analysis and this is prepared after a lot of discussions between the line managers and uh, the HR department and or the, I mean, the particular areas in which they want to recruit. So after proper discussions, the competency analysis is done and then they hire a third agency for recruitment of their candidates. So uh, 
this is the way they carry on. So different, of course, organizations may have their own processes, but what we uh, here want to indicate that uh, different organizations may have their own policies of recruitment and how they want to go about it. Some may first go for internal sources, some may uh, directly go for external sources rather than internal sources because uh, maybe they feel that the external sources are would bring in uh, new ideas, fresh minds, creative abilities. So maybe they go for external sources. Other organizations may feel that uh, cost-wise, it is better to go for internal sources and why not develop the loyalty of the employees and commitment of the employees by giving them uh, higher opportunities in the organization. So it may vary uh, from organization to organization. Now, when we talk of uh, internal source of recruitment, as I said, it may be from within the organization. So it may be trans through transfers and promotions within the organization. So if maybe if the organization is um, having a dif uh, different geographical locations, it may transfer uh, some of its employees to the wherever there's a requisition at a new place. Then promotions. Now promotion is the word is very simple, but if we do not uh, do a proper you know, job analysis, potential appraisal before doing the, before uh, promoting our employees, then the employee who is working at one position may not be as competent at a higher position. So even while promoting the employees internally, we need to have a, an idea and do a proper appraisal or assessment of the uh, capacity or the capabilities or the ability of the employee to meet the uh, requirements of a higher level uh, position. So then former employees, if uh, the employees, some of the employees may due to some personal problems or due to their own constraints, they may leave the organization. So some of them may be hired back to the organization and uh, create a win-win situation for the employee as well as the organization. So in that case, if some of the former employees uh, who were competent and they are still willing to come back, that can be also an internal source of recruitment. Then uh, previous applicants like uh, the organizations have their own data bank of applications. And instead of giving fresh ads or looking for uh, st uh, starting afresh with the new uh, applicants, they may just pick up their app this application blank and pick up the right candidates uh, if it is suiting their requirements. So it may not go for giving a new ad or looking for different sources of recruitment. So it may just pick up from the existing data bank. Now, uh, if we talk about uh, the internal so uh, this external source of recruitment so there are various sources of external recruitment now um in today's world uh, i mean e recruiting is very uh, common then the job portals are there like uh, monsterindia.com nokri.com indeed so that has also become a very important source of recruitment then uh, employee referrals that means the employees who are working within the organization, they may refer their own friends or relatives. And if it meets the expectations and the requirements of the organization, they may be hired. So employee referrals is one of the methods which Coca-Cola company is using, which they call it uh, for OK KO program. So in that particular program, they try to encourage their and the employees which they, who are already working within the organization to refer their um, friends or their relatives uh, for working in the same company. Then advertisements, of course, that is the uh, first and you know, it is the most popular method which is used. Like uh, if we all must have seen in Times of India, Ascent, Employment News, the raw vacancies coming up, especially for uh, and the skilled and highly qualified people. So that is one uh, very good source. And then of course, uh, talking about contract workers, some workers, this may be uh, for also semi-skilled workers, which may be these time, uh, in these days, even for you know, uh, uh, qualified professionals, sometimes it is uh, the appointment is on contract basis and the contract is renewed every year. So the con uh, through contracts also, 
yeah, based upon the performance, the contract of the employee may be uh, renewed. Then, of course, the employment exchanges are there. And uh, by registering in the employment exchanges, the companies also register in the employment exchanges and the uh, uh, candidates also, they put forward their resumes in the employment exchanges. And uh, whenever there's a job opportunity, the employment exchanges, they inform uh, the candidates and they build up a network between the pool of candidates and the companies and the candidates who have registered, they can uh, find more opportunities through the employment exchanges. Now campus recruitment has become a very uh, popular source of recruitment. So as um, Dean Sir was also uh, telling everybody that we also had a lot of uh, companies in Tachshila visiting the campus. Hindustan Unilever was there, Vivo was there, and many other OPPO was there, many other companies were there. So when when is this source utilized? When the company requires bright, fresh candidates and it requires a large number of candidates for various job profiles in the organization. So campus recruitment is there. And this is one of the methods which is used by Hindustan Unilever Limited. And Hindustan Unilever Limited, besides this, it has it uh, utilizes other sources also, like the job portals are there, the internet is there, the campus recruitment, of course, I said. So, uh, like big companies, they visit, especially when they want to hire fresh engineers or management trainees, and they want it in large numbers. In that case, they visit the campus and recruit the candidates from there. Then walk-ins may be there. That means some of uh, the candidates, they may just walk in and um, say, or they may just uh, enter the office of the company and uh, show their interest in joining a company or if they are in requirement of a job. So here, no formal kind of uh, selection process has been scheduled by, or no uh, vacancy has been published, but they have just walked in due to need for a particular job and it may uh, result in a you know, successful uh, term of uh, contract between the candidate and between the company. Then the consultants are also there who suggest that uh, who are going to be the right people for the organization and headhunters uh, are also there who try to find out, especially for the higher level positions that uh, who are the people at senior positions working in other organizations who can be hired by a particular company who has taken uh, the help of the consultants. So headhunters are again for the senior positions or the, for highly skilled people, consultants and uh, headhunters may also be a source of recruitment. So of course, campus recruitment we have already discussed. Then the contractors may be there, especially in case of labor. Uh, instead of company directly appointing uh, or uh, you know having laborers, it may give a contract to certain contractors and they may bring in their own labor. So that is especially for unskilled or semi-skilled workers. The contractors may also act as a source of recruitment. The radio and television uh, is slowly losing its importance as a source of recruitment in the previous times it was a very popular source although now fm is there so some companies do uh, give their vacancies on fm but uh, it's more on uh, you know social media these days and uh, other the company website i mean the company may just uh, on its website publish its vacancies and the candidates can uh, just apply on the website of the company and if their profile is found suitable they may be called for interview the social media linkedin facebook instagram twitter all these are again uh, they have become in the contemporary times a source of recruitment then competitors in the sense that uh, uh, one uh, term is poaching or raiding whereby you try to attract the people who are working in your competitive firms to come and join your organization. So uh, in that case, if uh, an employee or if a person is working successfully in another company, which is a competitor for your company, you may try to 
attract um, that company by giving a uh, sorry that uh, employee by giving a hire package to that particular individual and make him join your company so these are some of the sources external sources of recruitment and what sources of recruitment are used let me it all depends upon the recruitment policy of the company so a company may decide in accordance with the resources which is which is uh, it is having the kind of requirement which is uh, has for example for unskilled workers it may be just a factory gate uh, recruitment that means the workers may collect outside the factory gate and um, they from there only they would uh, be recruited and uh, they would join the company but this cannot happen for the skilled and the qualified personnel so it depends that what are the kind of jobs or what are the kind of job profiles which you want to fill through recruitment and selection process based upon that you can decide the various sources of recruitment so as i said the budget also needs to be checked the cost constraints where uh, what kind of profiles you want to have in your organization so uh, it has been shown by research that today 92% of the recruiters are using social media as a source of recruitment so uh, with the changing times uh, like the systems are also changing and uh, innovative methods of recruitment are being uh, used which were not there previously so uh, like of course we have to it's not that we just finish with the uh, tapping the source of recruitment we also have to evaluate and control uh, the entire recruitment process because uh, what is as i said the budget is there how much time has el elapsed in the recruitment process maybe you require a candidate immediately and your entire recruitment process took you one month just think of it that how much uh, you know the productive hours of the company have been lost and how much uh, the company how much the performance of the company or how much uh, the i mean the work of the company has suffered so you have to also think about that how much time would be required in filling up a vacancy and you have to evaluate whether you require after one month whether you require after two months or you require immediately so accordingly you have to monitor and then it is like as i said maybe if you receive a pool of 1000 uh, to 2000 applications those it's not necessary that all those applicants would be qualified enough to uh, join your company for that particular job profile so if the number of rejections at the first stage is very high then you have to rethink about your source of recruitment that means maybe you did not uh, go for the right source of recruitment and you have to rethink about another source of recruitment because those who have applied they were not even qualified so the entire time uh which you have spent and the resources which you have spent on the inviting the applications that goes to a waste and another thing like if uh, the number of candidates who have been selected uh is very less as compared to the number of applications which you have received again you have to rethink now it's not only about you know selection how many you are able to retain and what is the performance of selected candidates it's not that recruitment see all hr functions work in alignment you cannot separate the functions of human resource management you have selected the candidate that does not mean the job is over the selected candidate if he does not perform up to the mark or it is performing or he is performing below the expectations then you have to think that what went wrong with your recruitment selection process this may be due to a wrong selection you might have selected a wrong person for your organization so in that case again you have to rethink that what went wrong where it went wrong and accordingly you have to take the corrective measures then the cost of recruitment of course i already discussed then the projected image of the organization that means you know uh, when you are recruiting it is also very important that you create a good brand you means the company here i'm talking about like the company creates a good brand image a reputation so that it can invite qualified and talented people to the organization so uh, what is the projected image of the company that is one of the factors which influences the recruitment process of the organization if the company has good credibility in the market if the company has a good reputation in the market in that case more people would like to join that company 
On the other hand, if the company is not able to build up a good reputation in the market, then maybe not many uh, applications will be received and not many talented people would be joining the organization. So these are the uh, some of the things which need to be kept in mind when we are evaluating our recruitment uh, policy. So this is just in good humor. Uh, maybe a company is having a policy. This is just a cartoon in good humor. I'm sorry, I only hire married men. I like men who can take criticism. So this company is just looking for people who can handle criticism. So they are saying that maybe married men are able to take, uh, accept more criticism. They are more used to it. So they would hire only married men. So this is in good humor that uh, what we mean to say is that the recruitment policy of a company may be different. Now, for example, we talk about the recruitment policy of uh, enforcers. So, uh, you know, enforcers, they uh, like to hire uh, candidates whose values, middle class values, match the middle class values of the company. They want simple candidates, but qualified, intelligent, and uh, high performing candidates. And they feel that the value system, they give a lot of importance to the value system. So they want that value system of the employees should match with the value system of the organization. So uh, they want simple middle class people, although they do not compromise with the capability part, but they give a lot of importance to the adaptability of the candidate to the culture of the organization. And besides that, uh, some of the skills which uh, Enforcers looks for in its employees, uh, one uh, very important thing is the ability to innovate. They want to have candidates or employees who have a lot of ability to innovate, leadership skills uh, they want in their employees. They want teamwork, those who are uh, able to work successfully in a team. And they also want employees with strong communication skills and one very important thing now all this is besides academic excellence and professional excellence that of course is very important the academic excellence and professional excellence and another thing which they look for in the candidates is learnability that means how much they are able to learn from specific situations and apply them to other situations and curiosity is one of the big things which the employees are looking for in their candidates. As per a report by LinkedIn, it has been said what the employers are looking for. One uh, aspect is curiosity, hungry to learn. They want employees and candidates who are hungry to learn new things. So this is one very important skill. So as I said, uh, talking about the recruitment policy, as I said, the number of aspects involved in the recruitment policy of the organization. Then, uh, as I said, these terms, recruitment and selection, they are used simultaneously, but technically there may be some differences between the two. So uh, recruitment technically is more related to searching uh, for the candidates and creating a talent pool of the candidates for the organization. On the other hand, selection relates more to screening, screening of the candidates. So this is searching and this is more of, you know, choosing the right candidate or screening the uh, out of the applications and through various interviews, tests, etc. You try to find out that who are the most suitable candidates for your organization. So sometimes it is said that recruitment is a positive process and um, selection is a negative process. Why recruitment is called a positive process? Because here you stimulate, encourage people, maximum people to apply for your for the jobs in your organization. And as far as selection is concerned, there you reject the unsuitable candidates. So sometimes it is called that. It is said that recruitment is a positive. A positive process and selection is a negative process. So as I said that um, it is more of tapping of human resources and selecting the most suitable candidates through interviews and tests. So in the coming slides, we are going to also have a look at the type of selection tests and the interviews which are conducted. So and recruitment does not result into any contract of service between the employer and the employee. And that means if you are appearing for the interview, it, there is no contract between the employer and the uh, employee. But if you're selected, then it may result into a contract of service between the employer and the employee and the terms and conditions may be 
agreed upon in written. So recruitment does not result into contract of service, where a selection results into contract of service. So these are some technical differences between recruitment and selection. Now coming to selection process. So uh, as we said, like where recruitment ends, selection starts. So once you receive the applications, then you start screening the applications. So screening or shortlisting the candidates is very important because you cannot ask all the candidates to come and appear for the selection test, even if they do not meet your initial uh, expectations. You have to screen the application in terms of the qualifications, skills, uh, the experience required, the uh, profile which you are looking for, whether the profile or the resume of the candidate is matching with your expectations. And <clears throat> once you screen out a shortlist, then you go for selection tests. Those who clear the selection tests, they have to face interviews. And then uh, if they clear the interview, then they're finally placed in the organization <laughs> at the uh, profile for which uh, the vacancy was there. And then it may result into physical examinations and uh, checking for references. So this is again a part of uh, the selection process. That means uh, when you place the candidates, in that case, before placing, you may go for checking of references. It's, you may go for physical examinations and the medical examination of the candidate. So, of course, we're going to discuss more of this in the coming slides. The selection method varies from organization to organization, and this varies or differs due to levels for which uh, the selection is made and also based upon the need of the organization. So, this is a broad uh, you know, overview of the selection process. It may depend upon organization to organization as to how it is going to uh, synchronize its process. Uh, some may uh, have uh, vigorous interviews. Some may, uh, some organizations may not go for uh, tests. They may directly go for interviews. Some may have vigorous selection tests. So it all varies from organization to organization. Now, for example, in forces, if they, if you recruitment selection has to be made, they have the aptitude test. Then those who are able to clear that, they have to face the technical interview. Then they, uh, those who get selected, those have to face the HR interview. So as I said, in uh, uh, HUL, they have this uh, cognitive ability test also. And then the interview process starts with those who are able to clear this cognitive ability test. So uh, in other words, it may vary from organization to organization. In some organizations, the physical examinations may be there. In other, it may not be there. Checking of references is generally done, but again, it is not necessary that all organizations may go for it. So it is, uh, it, some of the steps may not be followed, some may be followed, but this is a broad overview of the uh, selection process, which is followed in organizations. <clears throat> so uh, talking about the type of selection tests, now, if we talk about the type of selection tests, there may be intelligence tests whereby you try to measure the analytical ability of the candidates. You try to measure the uh, this logical reasoning, the general knowledge of the candidate. Then the aptitude test may be there. That means uh, the ability of the candidate to learn a new skill when he joins uh, the organization. What is the aptitude? What is his mindset? Whether he will be able to learn some new skill or not. And then the achievement test or work sample test may be there. That means um, whatever uh, work the employee is expected to perform in the organization, the same kind of work is given to him and his performance is checked to find his suitability for that particular uh, job profile. Then the situational tests are there through simulation. Simulation means what? Creating an artificial environment which is very close to the real life environment. <clears throat> so uh, number of simulation methods may be used. Now group discussions may be there. Uh, through group discussions um, where there is no moderator and uh, where there's no uh, person who is guiding, no facilitator, nobody's guiding the discussion. The participants are just observed 
how they discuss they are given a particular topic and they are observed upon how they are speaking throughout the group discussion in the process their knowledge their communication skills their self confidence their uh, innovativeness their leadership skills the ability to take initiative and uh, coordination with the other group members everything can be checked then there may be uh, in basket exercises especially for managers that right? means in basket means like what is there in the daily basket of a manager what all he has to deal in his day to day working maybe he has to um, hold certain meetings maybe he has to uh, answer certain emails maybe he has to um, correspond with the uh, various parties or various clients so this is all done in a simulated kind of environment to check the suitability of the candidate for that particular post then the interest tests may be there that means uh, to check sometimes what happens is that uh, people do join the organization but their interest is in some other field so they join because they are looking for a job but they are not really interested in that particular profile so even if the employee has the qualifications for that particular post still his interest may lie somewhere else so i have uh, like uh, seen personally number of engineers who have worked for a certain number of years in this field they have lost their interest and now they are coming into some creative fields like acting modeling and things like that and we will know that many of uh, our actors are engineers they are en uh, engineers many of our you know film stars indian film stars they have the engineering degree so they have the degree but they do not have the interest so the interest tests uh, are also conducted to find out the uh, interest of the candidates for the job then the personality tests are conducted to check the personality of the candidate maybe his personality traits the self confidence the decision making ability uh, the optimism some may be very pessimistic some may be optimistic what kind of personality traits they are having and whether uh, they suit the organization so some personality tests are also there then polygraph tests may be used more in the military or in defense they may be used uh, now in this particular thing what happens is that they try to check the truthfulness of the answers which the uh, candidate is giving to the questions through uh, um, the, you know the uh, checking of the body language so of course it cannot be done by ordinary people it requires real experts who can handle this polygraph test so just to check the trustworthiness especially in um, these kind of profiles where the security jobs are concerned polygraph tests may be used then graphology that means through the handwriting of the candidate you try to uh, check the personality traits of the candidates you know some may write in a slant method some may have a loop when they write some may write straight so the handwriting experts they try to judge the personality of the candidate by graphology then assessment centers are there especially for the high level uh, posts for the managers uh, they may be maybe for two days they may be put up at a place where a lot of activities will be organized a lot of tasks will be given and a group of experts will be observing to check so number of situations how they are going to deal with those situations so for that particular time period the assessment is based up, uh, about their capabilities about how they handle the situations in these kind of assessment centers and uh, this is as i said specially used for leadership positions how uh, the managers are uh, handling uh the subordinates or how they are taking the decisions or how they are motivating or how they are handling a crisis situation all those things may be checked then uh, various kind of selection interviews may be there <clears throat> so the formal interviews may be there formal interviews and structured interviews where the everything is already pre decided what questions are to be asked uh from the candidates because everything sometimes it is very good to have formal interviews because no time is wasted you pinpointedly and specifically can ask the candidate on certain pre decided questions which you have framed based upon your requirements so no waste of time takes place and uh, you try to uh, check the suitability of the candidate for that particular position 
then sometimes unstructured interview where the questions are not pre-decided and uh, on the spot, like whatever the candidate answers out of that, you pick up another question and you ask him. So some um, um, like uh, organizations may use a mix of structured and uh, unstructured interview, but in unstructured, um, some on the spot questions are put up based upon the response of the candidate. Then some organizations go for stress interview. So that means they try to check the emotional balance and how much the candidate is able to handle stress in the, uh, or would be able to handle in future in the organization. Because uh, if the candidate is not able to handle uh, crisis situations, he gets very anxious or he gets very angry or he feels very stressed out in handling certain situations, he may not be suitable for certain posts where more of a calm and composed uh, kind of uh, emotional balance is required. So in this stress interview, uh, some kinds of techniques may be used. That means firing the questions before the candidate finishes the answer, the next question is put up, even criticizing his answers, creating long pauses in between uh, during the process of interview to present an awkward situation, which is deliberately created to check the mindset of the candidate that how he handles all these situations. So a stress interview is one kind of interview, then group interview when uh, the number of candidates is very large. And uh, in that case, uh, sometimes the panel may, there may be a panel of interviewers and they may invite group of candidates at the same time to uh, check their suitability for the job. And panel interview may contain representatives from uh, various departments, or uh, they may have uh, outside experts also. Their panel may be formed, and who is going to check the suitability of the candidate. So then, the of course, the in-depth interview may be to check the in-depth knowledge of the candidate, especially for technical positions. How much in-depth knowledge of uh, or the core uh, domain knowledge where it needs to be checked. So it may be an uh, in-depth interview. <clears throat> now, uh, also, we said that we have to go for reference checks. They may, once you are selected, then uh, they may ask the name of some references and usually they should be uh, persons uh, of high professional repute whom should, uh, whom should be named as referees and uh, they, the uh, companies, they want to check the um, credibility of the candidate the value system of the candidate and they want a reference check for that purpose. So that may be required. Medical examination is important uh, for some of the you know jobs. And these days, the companies, uh, they do go for some companies to go for to check HIV, whether the can if the candidate is not HIV positive. And now with the COVID-19, this is going to really become very important because no organization would like to have uh, employees who are suspe uh, suspected with the coronavirus. So with the incoming of uh, COVID-19, medical examination will become very, very important. It's uh, still being followed by a number of companies, but now I think it is going to be one of the first and foremost thing before the company wants any candidate to join. And then the placement, once the candidate has cleared all this process, then the placement of the candidate may be done uh, and uh, the induction of the candidate is done. He's oriented with the organization culture so that he imbibes the value system of the organization. He becomes aware of uh, the culture of the organization, whom he has to report to. Uh, sim even simple things are important in induction. For example, what is the time for lunch? What is the time for tea break? These are small things, but they may mean a lot to the employees. So uh, ranging from very big things to small things. So they may be included in the orientation or induction program of the candidates. Now, uh, so after talking about recruitment and selection, and uh, also seeing that how some companies are undertaking their recruitment and selection part, what are the skills they require, and how they are doing that, uh, we come to performance appraisal. Now, Appraisal, performance appraisal actually is what uh, I, yesterday when we were talking about uh, the role of an HR manager, so uh, we said that appraisal means what? It is the evaluation of the performance of the employee 
maybe after a certain time period in terms of the job requirements whether the targets which were set whether the goals which were set at the beginning of the year at the end of the year you try to measure you try to check out to what extent those goals have been attained whether there is a gap and if there is a gap what to do what can the what can be the measures uh, which can be done to close that gap, skill gap so uh, performance appraisal again as i said all functions of hr are aligned and they are interlinked so performance appraisal itself is very important why for taking certain decisions like if you want to decide about the uh, increment of the employee he has completed one year how do you do that there has to be some logical basis so performance is one very logical basis so from the beginning of the year till the end of the year to what extent the candidate or the employee has been able to meet the demands of the organization but for that you need to have in place it should not be just in a weird manner you have to uh, have in place a proper system of performance appraisal in the organization where the goals and objectives are set in the beginning of the year and uh, the organizations at the uh, the end of the year the for each candidate this kind of appraisal is done proper documentation is there proper data is maintained and through an unbiased way decisions are taken if you want to decide that uh, what kind of training program the employee needs i mean uh, the training and development programs organized by hr managers should not be a formality just for the sake of enriching their profiles it they have to be based upon proper analysis of the skill gap in which area the employee needs training how can you know that unless and until you do performance appraisal if you do not link your training and development programs to the performance appraisal system in that case the training and development programs will just be in name they will just become a formality how do you decide what the uh, promoting a candidate which candidate is suitable for uh, high level position so it will be a combination of performance appraisal and potential appraisal and sometimes uh, how do you decide that you want to fire an employee i mean there has to be some logical basis if you want to get rid of an employee no organization would like to do that deliberately but if the employee is a non performer then he may become a liability for the organization so what is the logical basis for all these decisions the logical basis for all these decisions is performance appraisal so uh, of course performance appraisal has a definite um, process whereby at the beginning of the year you set the performance standards that what are the expectations for a particular job profile for the marketing person it may be in terms of sales for the hr person different criteria may be there in terms of uh, recruitment selection in terms of workplace culture in terms of uh, employee engagement in terms of uh, performance management for production worker it may be in different terms like number of units which is expected to be produced uh, whether the quality part of the product not just the number but the not just the quantity also the quality so performance standards will again differ depending upon the uh, profile of the employee for whom you are doing performance appraisal then setting the standards is not enough the the employee should be communicated that this is what is expected for him at the beginning of the year he should be told that this are the expectations of the management and then only we can hold the person responsible if we do not communicate what are the expectations and we just measure the performance then it's not going to result into any kind of logical appraisal so the communication of the standards has to be made then um you have to measure the standards whatever time period is fixed at the end of the year maybe you will measure the standards and the measuring standards is not uh, you know just a joke there are proper technical uh, methods for measuring the standards and one has to be unbiased in measuring the performance of the employee and we're going to talk a little more about the standards and the methods of performance appraisal then comparing the standards where we have to compare the actual performance with the standard performance and check out that if there's a gap if there's a gap, then you have to discuss the results if you just keep a document of it that okay this was the skill gap and you put it into your file uh, and uh, that is finished it is not going to result any into, into any improvement the feedback has to be given yesterday we were 
discussing that how the feedback has to be given to the employee. You have to discuss the results in a proper manner. As I said, especially when there's a skill gap, the uh, employee sometimes may, may not accept it. He may get defensive and uh, others may get aggressive. The manager has to handle this situation in a very tactful manner. How he has to discuss without making any allegations upon the employee and it has to be in a suggestive mode with a proper feedback that how the performance needs to be improved it's not about just telling the employee that this is the skill gap and this is you have non-performed that is going to be very demotivating and is not going to result into any you know uh, result for the organization because the manager has not discussed that what the employee has not suggested now what is to be done for improving the standards uh, or the improving the performance so everything has to be done in a proper manner and then taking making corrective standards so maybe you have to lay down some corrective measures maybe if you feel that uh, sometimes the standards which were fixed they also need to be modified maybe the employee is not to be blamed there were some external reasons due to which he could not perform for example a production uh, worker may not have uh, been able to attain uh, the targets of the units which he was able to produce due to breakdown of the machinery in between so he was not able to do it and he is not responsible for the breakdown so he has not attained the targets but there are some external causes for it so you have to immediately rectify, find out what is the reason and take the corrective actions. So these are some of the examples of uh, the performance uh, appraisal methods, how it can be done. There are a number of methods. So this is one of the method like rating scale. So uh, you see here, this is a kind of form. The employee name is there. The rater's name is there. The department is there. Uh, in which department the employee is working, the date from which for which period this appraisal is being done. These attributes have been laid down. Dependability, whether the employee is dependable or not, whether the work assigned is taken up with responsibility and finished, whether the employee has initiative, what is the overall output, whether the employee is regular, what kind of attitude he has, whether he's able to cooperate and the rater has to rate him on a five point scale from ranging poor, to fair, acceptable, good and excellent. And then you try to find out the total score of the candidate. So, I mean, it, this is an example, but you can lay down various other uh, parameters for checking the performance, as I said, based upon the job profile. Now here, what will come into um, in the scene? Again, the job analysis, which we discussed yesterday, this has to be linked with job analysis because that will make it clear that what were the tasks, duties and responsibilities which were required to be performed by the employee. And on the basis of that, you can lay down these parameters and then check the performance. It should match the job analysis, which is not matching the job analysis. Again, this performance appraisal system is not going to work for you. Then sometimes the critical incident method, that means how the employee behaves in particular situations, uh, that becomes a parameter for checking the performance of the employee. For example, uh, say critical incident methods on June 21, the sales clerk patiently attended to customer complaints. He's polite, prompt, enthusiastic in solving the customer's problem. So here they are judging about the um, how a sales clerk is dealing with a customer. If the customer is complaining and the salesperson gets aggressive or replies back, uh, then he's not a good performer. So, but if he's polite, he's prompt, he's enthusiastic in solving the customer complaints, then definitely he would get a high rating. Then uh, it may be like the sales assistant stayed 45 minutes beyond his break during the busiest part of the year. He failed to answer uh, store managers call thrice. He's lazy, negligent, stubborn, and uninterested in work. That means even after the break, 45 minutes additional were taken by the sales assistant. In between the store manager tried to call him. He didn't, uh, thrice he was called, he did not answer. So he was not able to come up to the mark and uh, he was found to be negligent and stubborn. So how a person behaves in particular situations which are very important for the organization, that may be the critical incident technique. 
then it may be a simple checklist method. That means yes or no, the rater has to give the rating uh, on a simple checklist. Is the employee regular? It may be yes or no. Is the employee respected by the subordinate? Is he helpful? Does he follow instructions? Does he keep the equipment in order? As I said, these statements will again depend upon the what the uh, profile, the job analysis, and the tasks, duties, and responsibilities of that particular individual. You cannot have the same checklist for everybody. Uh, some of the statements may be same, but some may differ due to the difference in job profile of the employees. Then another method is false distribution method. So um, this method is also being followed by companies like G and uh, Wipro. They are following this method whereby they uh, have to rate a certain percentage of employees into some categories. For example, G has to rate 20%, they, they rate 20% of the employees as the top performers, 70% of the employees in the standard category, and the remaining 10% as low performers. So this is force distribution. That means 20% of the employees uh, will be categorized in the, as the star performers or as the top performers. 70% will be categorized as standard performers and uh, the remaining, that is the 10%, they will come in the low performers. So the force distribution curve may take place. Now, for example, poor, 10% uh, may be classified as poor, 20% may be classified as below average, 20, 40% may be classified as uh, average and 20% may be good and 10% may be excellent. So. Uh, this method, as I said, is, for, is being followed, but now uh, so things are changing and we are moving from performance appraisal to performance measurement. So this is an example of 360 degree appraisal, which is one of the methods being used here. Uh, the performance of the candidate is checked uh, from all the stakeholders, ranging from the customers, to the superiors, to the suppliers, team members, uh, peers, subordinates, and also self-assessment of the employee may also uh, be done. So, and in today's world, so that means we are checking the performance of the employee by, uh, from all the angles. We are taking the customer perspective, what, what the customer feels about the, this employee, the superiors, the team members, the subordinates, the peers, suppliers, everybody. And in today's world, we're also talking about 720 degree feedback. That means like uh, beginning of the year, or whatever the performance appraisal period is taken, 360 degree feedback is uh, taken. And then the goals and the expectations of the employee for the coming year are communicated to him. At the end of the year, again, 360 degree feedback is done. So 360 degree feedback of the employee is done twice. And that is why it, it is called the 720 degree appraisal. So this, has also, uh, this is also being used by a number of organizations. Now, what we are uh, going to discuss right now is that how we are moving from performance appraisal to performance management system, how organizations are moving from uh, simple measurement to managing of employee performance. So if, uh, if everybody has heard the name of Deloitte, so they were having, uh, this company was having once a year performance reviews in 2015 till 2015, they had that, but they scrapped off the system. And this was uh, replaced by weekly check-ins by the team leader. That means instead of checking the performance at the end of the year and giving the feedback at the end of the year, the entire uh, year has been uh, wasted and now the damage has already been done. So why wait for the year? So Deloitte scrapped off its once a year performance reviews in 2015 and this was replaced by weekly check-in by the team leader. Now, the important thing was that the check-in had to be initiated not by the team leader but by the team members themselves. That means they have to ask the team leader to give the feedback about their performance uh, within a week. So the initiative was given in the hands of the team members themselves and then it was not just simply a uh, check-in. Uh, it was also related to the 
feedback and the coaching part. That means the team leader simply did not just check the performance or told, told the employees about the, the team members about the gap. Feedback was also given on how to improve the performance and coaching was also given to the employees that how they can in the next week, what remedial steps they can take, constructive suggestions were given, proper guidance was given and then the company saw that there was a marked increase in the performance of the employees and organizational performance. Let me tell you why after all we are talking about performance appraisal, why we are talking performance management. We are talking of all this because the performance of the organization depends upon the performance of the employees. If our employees do not perform, how can the organization perform? So uh, the HR systems are not, they do not work in isolation. Everything is directly linked to the organization, uh, the performance of the organization. So we are talking about all this performance appraisal, not simply just to check the performance of the employee, but to ensure that the company or the organization is performing well, which it cannot do if the employees are not performing well. And we do not have a proper system of performance appraisal in the company. So they introduce quarterly reviews instead of uh, annual reviews. And each team leader, instead of focusing about the weaknesses of uh, the team member, had to focus upon four future focus statements about uh, that team uh, member. That means what positive things, what positive for, uh, things he sees in the employee or in the team member, which he would be able to accomplish in the coming year. So he had to give four focus statements about each team member. Then in Adobe, we are all aware of the name of Adobe. They also, uh, they gave up, they abandoned their uh, annual performance appraisal system in 2012 and they replaced with the regular check-ins and frequent feedback to the employees, which was uh, feedback, both positive and constructive. So constructive here means also giving suggestions for improvement, giving proper guidance for improvement. What was the outcome? There was marked increase in employee engagement. Employees felt more interested in their work. And at the same time, uh, the turnover of the employees, that means the rate at which the employees uh, were leaving the company, it decreased by 30%. So here you see that these companies who have introduced performance managers, but still not many companies have, are having this kind of system. So we need to move. From, we are just seeing companies who have uh, moved from performance appraisal to performance management and how there has been a marked increase in the performance of these companies. So what actually is performance management? So from these examples, I hope that some things are clear that uh, it is a continuous system of feedback rather than reviewing the performance at the end of the year. There's a continuous feedback and communication between the managers and the employees to ensure the achievement of strategic objectives of the organization. So uh, performance management is more of a system of continuous communication instead of just giving feedback at the end of the year, managing the performance of the employee throughout the year so that the employee is able to uh, come up to the expectations of the organization and the organizational performance, the organizational uh, profitability, the market uh, share of the organization, everything which depends upon employee performance that does not suffer. There is another example of General Electrics. Uh, so they had the rank and yang system. That means they used to rate the performance of the employees and they used to fire the low performing employees. So. Now, um, they, <clears throat> instead of having this rank and uh, yang system, they uh, introduced frequent feedback systems and uh, they called it touch points and this was introduced in 2015. They had this online and mobile app through which feedback, continuous feedback could be given to the employees. Things could be shared between the employees themselves and the superior and the subordinates so that immediate actions were taken rather than waiting for the end of the year. And then in the end, annual summary with the employees based upon their achievements and learning was made. So 
uh, if we have a look at the steps of performance management to have a proper understanding how the system works, we can see that everything starts with planning. So it has to be planned. Uh, the performance objectives are fixed, but here how it is done, that is different. That means the objectives are not one-sided. There's a uh, continuous discussion. There's a meeting between the superior and the subordinates and by mutual consent of the superior and the subordinate, the goals and objectives are fixed. So the goals and objectives are not dictated simply without uh, consulting the subordinate, but rather a meeting takes place between the superior and the subordinate and with mutual consent, they decide that what are going to be the goals and objectives for the subordinate. Then the monitoring part is done, how much he's able to accomplish within a time frame, And then the developing part becomes very important in performance management system. You can see the rating is coming afterwards. First, we monitor, try to find out the gap and we try to train the employee, we try to coach the employee or we try to give him constructive feedback. This will, what methods of developing we are adopting will vary uh, depending upon the skill gap and the profiles and the system of the organization. Once we develop, then only we rate the employee and then we go for rewarding the employee on the basis of performance. So the performance appraisal, I was not talking about the system of uh, continuous development of the employees or continuous discussions. It is more of a one-sided approach whereby uh, this performance management, it takes into account the viewpoints of the subordinates right from the time of fixing of goals and then com continuous communication with the employees is made throughout the process. Efforts are made to manage and develop the performance of the employee and then rating of course is done because you need some logical basis. Otherwise, how would you check whether the employee is uh, performing as per uh, the goal set or not? But before rating, some other things which are very important, they are done. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, this is just to give an idea about certain key result areas which are important part of performance management and here I've taken some key result areas that means the areas and we are talking about fixing the goals right we are, we are talking about fixing the objectives so those are actually the KRAs for particular job profiles so uh, for example the KRAs are the key result areas in which the employees are expected to perform so the KRAs for an HR manager may be recruitment and selection. Now, based upon this KRA, the KPA, that is the key performance area is laid down. If the KRA is recruitment selection, the, if we take the key performance area as recruitment, then the key performance indicator, that means it has to be in some, some you know, uh, proper terms and objective terms so that we can finally check out whether the goal has been achieved or not. So, for example, the KPI for recruitment may be reduce the average time taken to fill the vacancies by 15%. Uh, now, uh, so here you can see the re reduce the average cost per recruitment by 10%. So here proper quantitative uh, measures have been fixed in order to check whether the desirable goals for recruitment have been achieved or not. So maybe this organization wants to reduce the time and the cost. So accordingly, they have laid down. Then another key area may be the key result area, maybe workplace management. Under this, the key performance area may be labor turnover. That means the number of employees who leave the organization. So reduce the labor turnover by 20% and uh, or uh, reduce the benchmark the total hr cost externally the same ways it can be uh, kra may be safety and health uh, at workplace with uh, kpa may be reducing the workplace accidents and uh, again just if you mention reduce the workplace accidents i mean you cannot uh, really measure whether the accidents have been reduced or not so maybe you can quote reduce the workplace accidents by 10% building capabilities and organizational learning. So for that, the key performance area may be training and uh, the key, uh, key performance indicator may be all the workforce below middle management should receive a minimum four days training. Not training whom? Whom does this organization want to train? So they have specifically, it can be put 
that all the employees who are in the training program should be below the middle level management and they should receive a minimum of four days training. Similarly, for different job profiles uh, and different positions, the KRAs, KPAs and the key performance index may be laid down. So I hope that it is clear that uh, how organizations are moving from performance uh, appraisal to performance management. So performance management um, is going to rule the world in uh, the contemporary times, the current trends, and slowly and slowly the organizations are shifting their focus because it is not only going to be beneficial for the employee, but it is going to be more beneficial for the organization if they focus upon the performance uh, ma uh, management system. And we have already seen through live examples that how these uh, some of the organizations, the big names, the Adobe, Deloitte, and G, how they have benefited by scrapping off their old systems and uh, having new performance management systems in their organization. Now, uh, some of the current trends in human resource management, uh, which have an impact upon the HR function. One of them is, of course, the impact of digital transformation with the coming in of artificial intelligence. The systems are being changed. Recruitment, um, especially the artificial intelligence, is uh, has uh, made the recruitment process more, uh, you know, uh, cost effective and also time saving and unbiased. So uh, that is one part. Then data analytics in human resource management uh, has come to play and is going to play a big role. And uh, for that purpose, uh, the organizations need to update their systems. The employees need to skill themselves up in order to uh, meet the demands of the current environment and the challenges. They need to upgrade themselves technically also so that they can use these tools and techniques even in the field of human resource management. Then building employee experience uh, will be very important in this year because uh, the uh, employees in today's world, they uh, see salary is one important thing which they are looking for, but they're also looking for a number of other things like uh, the kind of overall experience which they have in the organization, the level of uh, the kind of culture, the workplace culture, the systems uh, in the organization, the way the, their bosses deal with them, the way they are handled, the way their uh, problems are considered, how much work-life balance they're able to maintain, what is their quality of work life, how many hours they are working in the organization, how much stress they have to face. So they are doing this cost benefit analysis for themselves. So uh, the employers also, they have to enrich the employee experience. And these days, Glassdoor, Indeed, they also uh, have the systems whereby they can take the reviews from the employees. They can rate their organization. So it has become very important to enrich the employee experience to retain good employees and also uh, to keep them highly motivated to attain organizational goals. So continuous performance management, we've already talked about. So uh, that is, as we said, we will move and we are moving from performance appraisal to performance management. So performance appraisal can be made a part of performance management, but it should not be that we are only doing performance appraisal and we are forgetting about the other important things when we are talking about employee performance which again, I repeat, has a strong impact upon the profitability of the organization and uh, the competitive edge of the organization in the market. Then training and development is going to play a very important role and it is still playing, but now uh, it will become more important because uh, organizations need to upskill their employees in the wake of uh, the continuous changes in the environment, the changes in the technology, and of course, uh, the need for refreshing the skills and upskilling of the employees and uh, reskilling of the employees. So corporate training is one thing which is uh, becoming very important and uh, even virtual training will uh, become more important in this kind of um, era of COVID-19. So the platforms which are used for training and development, that is going to be very important because if the employees are trained, 
they will perform well. If they will perform well, who's going to benefit? The organization is going to benefit. So this is one thing which the uh, employers would be looking forward to. And then improving employee engagement. That means, engagement means uh, the dedication, the commitment with which the employee works for the organization. That is one area which has to be worked upon. Uh, so uh, building up employee engagement, how to develop the loyalty part in their employees, how to uh, make the employees more involved, more attached, more committed to the organization. That is going to be another challenge for the uh, HR managers and the top management in today's world. Then uh, other things, important things, what are the current trends? It's recruit for skills rather than only for degree. So <clears throat> this is one important trend. And uh, that means the employers are looking not merely, it's not just that you have a degree and you get a good job. Unless and until you are able to uh, prove yourself and justify the degree in terms of your skill enhancement, just by having the degree is not going to serve any purpose. So uh, the em uh, employers in today's world, they are looking not, the degrees are important, no doubt. But if you just have the degree for namesake without focusing upon improvement of your skills, in that case, uh, it's not going to be of much help. So the employers would be looking for skills. That means what kind of skill set the employee, uh, the candidate is having. Then consider soft skills to be the power skills in 2020. Now, in spite of the fact that the artificial intelligence has come in, digital transformation has come in, the soft skills have become all the more important and they are going to be the supreme, the most powerful skills which would be required in 2020. The more digital transformation will take place, more will be the importance of soft skills because uh, soft skills are one thing which the machines cannot do, which the technology cannot do, which, uh, which is unique to the human beings only. So uh, according to LinkedIn, this is soft skills in spite of digital transformation will continue to uh, reign the world and uh, they will be still considered very important now, uh, you, we can have a look at the top five uh, soft skills in demand in 2020 as per LinkedIn Learning 2020 Workplace uh, Learning Report. So LinkedIn has given this report on the basis of which they have given the top five soft skills in demand in 2020. They have put as creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, and emotional intelligence. See, these are the five top skills, soft skills in demand in 2020. So, Emotional intelligence has also become very important. That means how you balance your emotions, how you deal with people, how you understand the emotions of others and deal with them appropriately. So it's a big, uh, you know, um, uh, issue to be talked about, which uh, due to limitation of time, I will not talk about much about this, but yes, IQ and EQ, there are two things. And in today's world, EQ has become uh, equally or even more important than IQ and it has been proved by research studies that 80% of the success of a person depends upon his EQ rather than IQ. So this is a, uh, another very big field which I cannot talk right now much upon it because of the limitation of time. Then uh, employee health, safety and hygiene become very important. Yesterday also we discussed because of COVID-19 this is one area which is to be taken care of, ensuring the health of the employees. That's, this is one thing which cannot be messed up at all in the present times. And uh, proper <clears throat> sanitization of the workplace, social distancing norms, uh, proper safety measures, standard operating procedures to be followed, <clears throat> masks to be uh, you know, made mandatory at the workplace, so these are some of the things which are really going to be important in, and this is going to be the new normal in today's world. Then employee well-being and happiness management, that is again becoming very challenging in the present times because like yesterday also we discussed that how the stress level and the worry level of the employees has been increasing. And I also discussed the Gallup 
report yesterday that how in the US population, the stress level is increasing and how the uh, this uh, worry level is increasing in the population. So <clears throat> how to ensure the happiness of the employees, how the organizations are going for meditation programs, yoga programs, uh, happiness management workshops. They're trying to balance the quality of work life of the employees. A number of things are there uh, for ensuring the employee well-being and making them happy. Now, why are we talking of all this? Because it is going to have an impact again upon the performance of the organization. If the employees are happy, they're going to perform well. If they are, uh, they uh, feel that the organization is taking care of them, their engagement level is going to increase, their commitment towards the organization is going to increase, and the organization is going to benefit out of it. So these are some of the current trends in human resource management. <clears throat> now, uh, talking about the careers in HRM. So these are some of the profiles on which HR people can work. These are some, like we have HR manager, human resource director, HR consultant, international human resource professional, chief HR officer or vice president of human resources, then labor relations director, payroll manager, recruiting manager, training and development manager. As you can see there is there are ample number of profiles on which HR people can work and are working. Then there is employee education consultant, executive recruiter, human resources, IT specialist, employment recruitment and placement manager, international human resources associate, compensation and benefits manager, people analytics director, employee engagement specialist, talent manager, manager or director of learning, diversity officer. So <clears throat> different organizations may have different profiles and uh, the opportunities to work at these profiles has to be leveraged by the uh, candidates and those who are interested in the field of human resource management. So these are examples of uh, famous HR heads in India. You can see these are some of the examples like um, Ajayendra Mukherjee, who is the global HR head of TCS, Nandita Gurjar, senior vice president and group head HR enforces. Then for uh, Wipro HR technologies, we have um, Saurabh Goval, who is uh, the VP HR. Then Reliance Communications, we have Rajan Datta as the president corporate HR. Then Dhruv Desai, who's the HR head at Angel Broking Private Limited. Then Microsoft's uh, senior human resource director. We have Mr. Gill, DK Srivasta, who is the senior vice president of corporate human resources and HCL technologies. For Accenture, we have Mr. Manoj Biswas, who is the India head of human resources. We have uh, Mr. Krishnamurthy, who is working as the VP HR LNT. Now, what we want here to reiterate is that these people must have started somewhere, they must have made a beginning before reaching these high posts. Rome was not built in a day. You need to put in a lot of hard work. You need to show your passion towards a particular field. And if you have that passion, if you have the dedication, and if you're ready for the hard work, then there is no end to success. So even uh, there are high profiles in HR and these people must have started, uh, made, made a beginning at some lower profile. And today that is why because of their country's commitment, dedication, and passion in the field of HR, they are where they are. Um, these are ample examples. Still, you can see ample examples of people who are working in the field of HR. You can see the profiles also, director HR. You can see the name. These are the names of the people. These are the name. Uh, these are the profiles and these are the organizations for which they are working. Senior VP HR, head HR, director global HR, country head HR, director HR. These are the names of the companies for which they are working. LNT, you can see good names. IBM India Private Limited, HIL. Uh, so <clears throat> what we mean to say is that if you're really interested, you're really committed, and you have passion for HR, then it's a good thing. Uh, and it can uh, give you a very lucrative and stable kind of you know, job profile and a respectable kind of job profile in the long run. So I would like to end uh, with the small quotation that is to win the marketplace, you must first win in the workplace. This quotation is given by Doc Honand, 
who was the CEO of Campbell Soup Company, that if you really want to win in the marketplace, first of all, you must win the workplace. And that is where the importance, the significance of human resource management lies. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll end my session over here and we can take up the questions now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, let's take up the questions here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, there is a question which came uh, yesterday also. And the girl is asking, what is the difference between traditional and agile HRM? Okay, so uh, traditional HRM basically is focused more upon the routine functions of human resource management. The routine functions which we talk about uh, recruitment and selection, compensation, payroll, these are the uh, traditional functions of human resource management. And as we are talking that now, the focus of HR is changing from the routine functions to the position of uh, say strategic human resource business partner, culture steward, business ally. We are talking of uh, new profiles in the field of HR. That means HR is no longer restricted to the simple administrative work which was required and it is becoming more agile in terms of enhancement and enrichment of the job profiles whereby it has come to the position of uh, the business partner in the role of business partner and the role of a counselor in the role of a trainer in the role of as we are moving from performance appraisal to performance management so the focus is shifting so that there is where the difference can be created uh, ma'am, there is one more question about data analytics. How can we relate it with human resource management? Okay, so uh, HR analytics, of course, now in today's world, now all the human resource management is being done on the basis of people analytics. So now this, the systems, the processes of human resource management, as we said that the digital transformation is taking place. So based upon the analysis of the data which is related to HR. Uh, we maintain the records of the employees. We are talking about performance appraisal of the employees. We are taking, uh, talking about taking the decisions uh, based upon certain data. And uh, based upon data, we can take a number of HR decisions. If Even if we want to talk about the promotion of the employee, it has to be based upon some HR analytics. If we want to go for uh, recruitment selection, if you want to go for training and development. So everything in today's world can be done with the help of HR analytics. So it is more focused upon data related things whereby you can take the decisions based upon HR analytics. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there is a question about um, in government jobs, we have seen that there are people who are getting the, you know, the successors, you know, they're getting the job after the demise of one of the job worker. So uh, what is it considered to be? Is it an internal source of recruitment or external? Your comments. Okay, that means in government job after the demise of a particular person. So yes. it can be an internal source of recruitment because uh, see it is from within the uh, organization only. Uh, see, uh, if the, there is a demise of a particular person and his family member, so the organization is not publishing any vacancy it is not publishing any advertisement on social media, but already uh, through that particular employee who was working and due to some uh, contingency, he is no more with the organization. The, uh, the organization has not looked for some external uh, hiring. So uh, we can consider it as more of an internal source. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can you establish a connection between the artificial in intelligence and HR? Yes, as I said earlier also, that uh, artificial intelligence is going to play a big role in the field of human resource management. And uh, especially in the recruitment part, as I said, uh, with the screening, you know, uh, in the screening of applications, uh, 23 hours of, uh, and rec of a recruiter are lost in recruiting in a screening of the applications. Now this time can be saved with the help of artificial intelligence tools and chatbots are there and various other measures are there whereby you can screen the application. This can be done in an unbiased manner. 
because where uh, the human element may result into some bias you know uh, the way systems are in india so when you are getting some applications and you get a call from so and so minister that this person has to be recruited at a particular position and you give a preference to that system mm -hmm. or uh, maybe you are well known to an applicant and uh, you just deliberately even if he is not you know qualified for the job you may have that tendency to uh give him a uh, you know a place in the recruitment selection uh, part although he may not be qualified so the unbiased it can be done in an unbiased way the time can be saved it can be cost effective so number of benefits can be derived okay. uh ma'am students are asking that you have lots of people from different kind of background right so how can we keep them uh, uh, ethical i mean how can we maintain their ethical standard while working on job uh, you mean to say the employees who are working in yes. the yes yes organization how can we keep them ethical okay so uh, like every organization has a code of conduct and uh, the sometimes the employees uh, even have to sign that code of conduct before joining the organization companies like reliance they have their own code of conduct and they need to um the employees who are joining they need, they have uh, made the rules and regulations which the employees are expected to follow the kind of behavioral norms which they are expected to follow and uh, the kind of you know uh, the systems which they are expected to follow you know ethical i understand being ethical is a very big challenge but we do have business ethics like we must do business but it has to be in an ethical manner so it is not only about keeping the employees ethical it's also uh, keeping the business ethical so it is equally important for the employers as well if you are ethical yourself your employees will learn from your example so it's not about just preaching the employees to be ethical it's about first leading by example having ethical values in the organization ethical training can also be given to the employees from time to time awareness may be created from time to time workshops can be cre uh, held and uh, such kind of training can be given ethical training is also kind of training which can be given to the employees so what i said is important is that even for the management it is very important for the employees it is very important to be ethical because uh, it is uh, from the the system flows from the top so if everything is ethical in the organization the employees will automatically fall into place and there will be less unethical practice in the organization okay and yesterday also uh, the same question came on the special skills of hr you know right. what are the different kind of skills required so somebody is asking how can we develop on them can you please guide the students here okay okay so uh, this is specifically for hr uh, they are asking yes ma'am okay so one thing is uh, of course you know the technical knowledge part has to be taken care of you need to be aware of uh, technically what are uh, you know the hr systems policies practices what are the um, compensation methods for example then what are the training and development methods to be followed what are the performance appraisal methods because technically you will not be able to handle unless and until you are aware of these things and this can happen only when you are uh, continuously devoting time into learning these skills uh, handling short term internships or uh, taking short term projects in organizations and joining uh, some training programs so this is one part and uh, you know mba and hr is one thing whereby they would learn all these things and they would get an idea with some uh, times it is felt that uh, you know hr has nothing technical in it but hr has the most important things uh, which probably no other domain is going to have and because as i said every manager needs to be an hr manager whether he is in the marketing field whether he is in the finance field he will have to deal with a team he will have to deal with number of employees and talking about other skills negotiation skills is something very important yesterday we were talking about communication skills which is very important developing emotional intelligence is very very important conflict management skills are very important and uh, self management skills are very important so there's a long list of various skills which need to be developed uh, in order to become and you know uh, this can only be developed through training and practice
there are only two things which I would like to say. Working, training, practice. Three things. You get trained, you actually do the things, and you practice it continuously, and you imbibe it in your lifestyle, and you have a passion for it. So if you have these things, you can be well equipped to meet the uh, demands of the HR profession, how to deal with people, interpersonal skills. All these things can be developed through training and then practicing it, applying it, getting some exposure, doing some internships in the companies. And this is the way you can learn. Uh, Ma'am, there is a student who is saying the students who are doing their MBA from uh, small places or those who come from small places, generally they do not get a role of strategic HR as compared to the ones who are, have done their MBA from a very big place or maybe from a very good institute. So what should be done in order to fill the gap? Because as all the students cannot do their MBA and PGDM program from big colleges around in the world. Okay, so they are doing uh, MBA in HR, but they do not know much about strategic HR. Yeah, that, no, that's the question. No, no, the question is since they are not doing their MBA from a very big college, right? Yeah, but they are doing MBA. Yes, yes, they are doing MBA, they have taken up HR, but they do not know much about strategic HR. Yes. Okay, so uh, I really don't know from which colleges they are, but strategic HRM is one important paper of human resource management. Strategic HRM is one important paper of uh, human resource management. So if they can request, if that can be introduced, uh, that is one part, of course, that may not be there in their hands. But yes, reading a lot, reading, um, you know, and uh, also becoming aware of the surroundings, reading newspapers and uh, reading pink papers, the Economic Times, uh, business today and having a focus upon how see if you have an HR mindset any happening in the business world should create uh, that kind of thinking how HR is going to be impacted what can HR do about this so that will develop uh, your mindset as to how HR can be a business partner so reading is one thing studying it as a paper which is very important is another thing and also having that kind of mindset whereby whenever when you, there is any happening in the business world try to develop that kind of mindset and how it is going to have an impact upon hr what are the hr perspectives towards that so number of things can be there and of course uh, some you know online courses may be there or some other uh, you know those platforms may be there some workshops may be there. Um, they can request their institutions if they cannot run it as a paper. At least it can be kind of workshop uh, th kind of thing where these things can be made clear to those students. So and there are various options. Right. Uh, Ma'am, uh, there is a question on uh, how people are recruiting nowadays. You know, uh, he has an opinion and he says the recruiters, when they're hiring the faculties, they always look for education and qualifications. Uh, they they look look for, uh, can you, I beg your pardon, please. They look for yes. uh, faculties who are being hired by the various education institutes. They generally look forward for the education and qualification. Right, and right. They never focus upon the soft skills. And whatever is written in CV does not, you know, give you a justification of what you are as a person. So, right. how can we really convince a person to take your interview? Right. If he's not convinced with what is written on papers. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good question. Right, right. So, see, some, uh, you know, minimum eligibility norms are there for uh, every work profile which need to be followed. We cannot compromise with that. Because uh, like uh, talking about, especially about faculty, so we have uh, bodies in India, we have UGC, we have AICT. So all institutions are expected to follow those norms. And uh, it is for the candidates to come up to those, at least minimum qualifications have to be there. If you want to come into the teaching profession, uh, like if uh, net is compulsory, you have to go for it. If PhD is there, you have to go for it. If post graduation, everybody cannot be suitable for a particular job. That is one thing that you upgrade at least your minimum eligibility. And secondly, yes, soft skills. Uh, see, 
uh, if you meet that at least the minimum eligibility criteria, you will be called for the interview and there you can prove your soft skills. But if you are not meeting that minimum eligibility criteria also, then it will be really difficult because after all, institutions also have to follow the government rules and regulations. They cannot recruit unqualified people. So you have to enhance your qualifications. Once you do that, then of course you can focus that, yes, you have good soft skills and you can get selected in institutions. I think ma'am, uh, we've taken lots of questions here. Uh, before we end up this uh, webinar, um, uh, I would like to mention here, um, since we are talking about HR, so I think all the students present here in the webinar, they really need to know what Takshila is doing in this direction. In fact, uh, Takshila has been able to place its HR students in an average package of 7.50 lakhs per annum and 11.20 lakhs per annum as its highest package. So I think um, as it was uh, spoken in the beginning of the session by uh, our Dean Sir, Mr. Rajat Bohra, that we are trying to create a system where the students uh, are made competent enough in the various domains. And we try to apply the business analytics, you know, in all the major streams of PGDM program, be it marketing, HR, finance, and so on. So um, uh, that was really a great session. And uh, thank you, Professor Sony, ma'am, for being with us here. Now we have... Uh, uh, the webinars, uh, two new webinars coming up and uh, I just want to clarify here that e-certificates for these two webinars